Hello there and welcome to the channel. This is Nerd World History and I'm continuing my exploration of the different Celtic tribes of pre-Roman Britannia. In this episode we're looking at the Votadini from the northeast of Britain or southern Scotland type of area. Now to be clear there is a lot of actual information about these but a lot of it is post-Roman which I will touch on but it isn't really the main focus of this video so if I do leave some information out from the 2nd, 3rd, 4th century AD, which there is information about. Sorry, that's just not what I'm covering in this episode, but I may do them in the future. But at the moment, this is everything before the Romans, or at least during their invasion. Anyway, Votadini, Northeast. Before we get started, please like, share, subscribe, and comment down below. Maybe hit the bell notification icon if you really like it, and check out the other videos on this channel. There is a whole playlist on this subject. This video is also brought to you somewhat in collaboration with The Beard Struggle, who I will get to later as they have given me permission to use a code, which, when clicked on by you, you will get 15% off your first purchase from their website. But again, we'll get to them later in the video. Now, let's get started on the Votadini. The Votadini were a tribe that lived in northeast Britannia. The Romans recorded them as a br local British tribe, one of the so-called petty kingdoms from the north. The territory they actually controlled was mostly in Scotland, but also controlled parts of northern England. And it was basically from the Firth of Forth all the way down to the River Tyne, sort of the Northumberland area of northern England. The tribe actually as seemingly as an occupied entity and petty kingdom, again, there is evidence for their existence of people living in the settlements that would be Votadini settlements as far back as 3000 BC, when people first seem to have turned up in the area and begun building. And already at that point they had trade connections all over Britain, from Cornwall to Wales to southern England. Now, when Brythonic Celtic culture was introduced to the area, probably around 7800 BC, the Votadini began to build more impressive hill forts, and you've got the, the beginnings of the Celtic kingdom of the Votadini. Fast forward a number of years, as basically there's not much else to tell in that time period other than what the Romans record, and I'll, I'll contradict the Romans in a minute. The Romans record them, obviously they were engaged by Roman forces as they pushed north into Scotland and were eventually driven out. The Votadini were amongst the tribes that fought against them. The Votadini, later in the sort of first quarter of the second century AD, Antoninus invaded Scotland again and he engaged the Votadini in various battles and pushed forth all the way up to what became known as the Antonine Wall, the slightly less famous baby brother of Hadrian's Wall. At this point the Votadini became a kingdom a part of the Roman province of Britannia. They were absorbed, although be it only for a short time until the Romans were pushed back to Hadrian's Wall, at which point the Votadini regained their independence. Now, they at that point though were kind of got used to the Romans and they became a client kingdom rather than an enemy and they were used as a buffer state, a bit like how the Brigantes had been used as a buffer state by the expanding Roman Empire when they were conquering southern Britannia. The Brigantes have been used as a buffer against the Votadini for example. Now it was the Votadini who were a buffer against the Caledoni and others who were a bit further north. And they seem to like it, they seem to thrive in that trade and network. Now the Romans, as I said, are where I'm going to contradict them. The Romans referred to these petty kingdoms to the north as very warlike and violent and prone to infighting. Now archaeological evidence at their various hill forts actually contradicts somewhat what the Romans say as the hill forts often go in and out of use. Now that's common across the Celtic world, not just in Britannia, it's also in Gaul and Germania, even in Spain, and obviously in Ireland. Now, the um, forts would also go into a state of disrepair periodically. This is not exactly condu conducive with a very warlike, hyped up warrior society. You think you're in a constant state of war, you're not going to let your walls fall down, are you? And they weren't knocked down, these were literally, they'd have to, they, the evidence is that they would need repair and they'd sort of let them crumble and eventually someone would come along and fix it. But basically, the Romans referred to them as being quite warlike, but in reality, you're an invading army, you're going to see the hostile side of the people you're attacking. That's basically how you would view them. 
there's not really much evidence in the prehistoric period. I mean, prehistoric evidence of open warfare in Britain is pretty scant to begin with, because of course there's no written records. That said, in Old Welsh, and I'm not going to attempt to pronounce any of these things, so I'm not even going to try, because I can't pronounce modern Welsh, never mind old, and we're talking old Brythonic. The Votadini, or Wotadini, as they also may have been called, just to point it out, they might not have actually been called the Votadini, uh, are recorded as the Godini in later centuries. This is where I said I will, at the beginning of the video, I might touch on the later things, but it's not really going to be the focus of this video. There is a lot of connection between the Votadini and Wales. Now, oral traditions and poems, one of the oldest Brythonic poems in this country, originates supposedly with the Votadini, and it was later wrote down in Welsh in Wales, as there is, say, there is a connection there. Now, the poem isn't really relevant, but the point is they've got one of the oldest poems and literature from the whole of Britannia. Before I go any further, I'm just going to quickly plug The Beard Struggle. Now, The Beard Struggle, if you've never heard of them, of course, they are all about men's grooming, and they provide beard-related products, including oils and various other things, conditioners and other things, and they also provide very handy and very entertaining tutorials on how to properly take care of your glorious beard. And if you are someone like me that really does embrace the facial hair, mostly to compensate for the lack of something else in my case, but you will find the beard struggle are awesome. First of all, their adverts that they use to advertise their products are amazingly funny and great, and hopefully I'll have one somewhere, but I might not. Don't remember if, I'm, if I remember to do it. But I recently got this from them, which comes in a very nice bag, which is something I can recommend because it is awesome. And it is the beard straightener. It's it's fantastic. Comes with this as well. It nicely poofs up your beard in the sh in the um, the best way possible. I'm not going to turn on because it takes a while to heat up. But yeah, if you want to have a glorious beard, one's probably better than mine because it's probably in need of a little more. T I think I need to give it a bit of a trim. I need to grow a bit more of the size of it anyway. Go to the Beard Struggle. If you follow the link in the description below, you will get 15% off your first purchase. It's a link that they gave me and told me I can share it with my subscribers, so all good. It's 15% off only your first purchase, but I think you will find it worth it, and I can really recommend that beard straightener because it's invaluable, especially if you do have a fa facial hair that's like mine, because in reality when I wake up in the morning this thing's just a mess, it goes insane, and it's naturally very curly and is incredibly irritating. And without a straightener and without um, balms and stuff to keep it, it'll just coil into an insane mess and look like I've got dark brown on my face, which is what I've been told I look like when it's there. Of course, with this one I also ordered a lovely bottle of heat protection spray, which I'm told is necessary, otherwise I'll frazzle it. But with all that said, back to the video. One quick thing to mention, which I've had to record this when I'd actually finished recording a lot of stuff because I meant to mention it and completely forgot. One thing about the Votadini is they have a little claim to fame from the 5th century BC, which is one of the real prehistoric things we can mention about them we know for certain, although it's a little ambiguous as to why this happened in the Votadini's territory and no one else's. Chariot burials in Britannia are quite rare, most of them found in the territorial borders of the Parisi tribe. And guess where they originally came from? They have, in the 5th century, the only known, or at least at the time, only known chariot burial in that area, uh, outside of the territory of the Parisi, at least at the time anyway. It was created in the 5th century BC inside a Bronze Age burial cairn near, at Hewley Hill. And it's just worth mentioning that that's a fairly distinctive thing known to this tribe. But there's only one that's ever been found. That's not to say there aren't more, but we haven't found them yet, or they've been destroyed by ploughing or whatever. But yeah, that was something worth noting. And I completely forgot to mention it. I, as I said, I want to do this after I've finished recording the rest. So getting back to the Votadini, their home territory, of course, there are, as I said, multiple hill forts and evidence that they were quite warlike as a petty kingdom, as the Romans like to call it. But their capital may have been a place called Trapine Law Hillfort. And I hope I'm saying that correctly. And it's quite a big one. 
and there's plenty of evidence of imported goods from the Roman Empire in this hill fort. It seems to have been seems to have probably the centre of their activity. Now, from about 300, well, the 4th century onwards, there is the possibility that the tribe was absorbed somewhat more into the Roman Empire, with possibly they become part of one of the four provinces, or possibly a new province being created, but that's speculation. Now, later, as the Roman Empire fell in Britain, the Votadini tribe would be somewhat, they would somewhat leave their homelands, go elsewhere, but they would also, the ones that seem to stay, Trapine law seemed to prosper around this time period, seeming as the Roman Empire fell apart, likely speculation only, raiding across the border and picking up goods that the Romans were leaving behind now the legionnaires were gone. But that seems to have been, at the end, they, they were absorbed later into later successive kingdoms and, as I said, they were known as the God into the Welsh, the Godini rather. The, the tribe itself was very ancient, had been around a very long time, but unfortunately there's not a great deal on them from the prehistoric period. This, of course, is their, their capital, Trapine Law, but obviously because they don't really have any written records and they're so far north, their contact with continentals like the Greeks and the Phoenicians, Phoenicians and the Romans who actually visited Britain, they didn't have any contact directly with the Votadini, so it's hard to say. Now, just for the sake of this video, I'm going to stay on Trapine Law as it seems to be the capital, and there's more information about it. Trapine Law was home to literally hundreds of roundhouses that seem to have been there at more or less the same time. Now, a single roundhouse may have been home to a very large extended family, a bit like in um, nations such as China now, where there was a tradition of grandparents, children and grandchildren, all perhaps living in the same household, where you kind of look after your successors, which is a bit different to Western culture. We're used to the idea that you push your kids out and get them independent and go look after themselves out in the world. The ancient Celts were not like that. You would have generations looking after the generations that came before them as they got older. So a single roundhouse could have several generations of a single family or even extended family living in it. And these were actually pretty big dwellings. Don't underestimate the size of a roundhouse. Some of them were pretty damn big, especially when you start getting into things like wheelhouses and stuff like that, which not really for this video, but yeah. These houses were also home based on the artifacts that had been found, bits of slag and other things, were, to, were home to many skilled artisans, enamel workers, and various other people that were involved in industry and production rather than just simple agriculture or other sustainable life skills such as those. This was a wealthy kingdom that could support tradesmen and specialists in different crafts who likely exported to the Romans, not just to other Celtic tribes. Hence, probably why the Romans had an interest in them at all in being a client kingdom. This is also evidenced by all this, the sheer volume of Roman artifacts, particularly Roman silver that has been found there, like this rather nice flask that hopefully I'll remember to put on the screen. So, here we are. They, in their day, were a very successful tribe. They had survived for hundreds of years before the Romans came, and they survived after the Romans as well. They came, they saw, they failed to conquer, I suppose. Now, with that said, there we have the Votadini. And they are one of the more interesting tribes I've researched. I know they staunchly resisted the Romans when they first came, but they seem to eventually come around to things. It's one of the things about, um, I remember reading, now this isn't specifically relating to the Votadini, I'm going a little off topic here, it's about the Picts, who were the successive civilization that came after them. In fact, calling them Picts is in and of itself wrong. That's not who they were. For example, we sometimes refer to Scotland as Caledonia. But it's actually, again, the Romans that give us these concepts. The Caledoni were a specific tribe that eventually I'm going to cover. But the Romans kind of group everything together. They would just simply refer to the Caledonians. But they actually would lump them, the Votadini and others, all together as one name. The Caledoni were probably the biggest, baddest group up in Scotland as it was. So, yeah, they, they tend to lump them all together when actually there were smaller kingdoms. That's why the Romans are sometimes, again, referred to petty kingdoms, things like that. But, again, a little off-topic, but basically the Picts, again, a bit of a misnomer because the Picts, or Painted Peoples, as we generally think it refers, is again a Roman, or later term used by the Anglo-Saxons, not what they necessarily called themselves. But that's a completely different subject, and it would be way beyond the scope of this, but the point was, I remember reading that the Picts, 
remember, they were not directly their ancestors, the, who were the Celts, because the Picts were just the Celts, basically. They were a culture that was heavily influenced by the Romans, although not directly conquered by them. Before the Romans, in Scotland, you didn't get all, like, the Pictish symbols were used to, like, snakes carved onto rocks and sort of marker stones and things like that that pop up all over the landscape. That was something that seemed to happen due to pressure from outside sources from the Romans. So the Romans, although they did not directly conquer Scotland, they had a strong influence on its cultural and technological development, particularly in those early centuries. It forced the Scottish um, tribes into a more cohesive, unified state to oppose them. It brought them together as having a more of a cultural identity separate to that of the people that were south beyond the border, which is one of the tragedies, really, of modern society, where there is this divide. Although I think I'd like to think by the 21st century it's more of a old rivalry, a bit like between the English and the French, whereas I don't think English or French people genuinely hate each other, and I'd like to think that English and Scottish people don't genuinely, at least not a mass, hate each other. Of course, there's always exceptions to every rule, but effectively that, again, that divide, that line on the landscape, that was created by the Romans. This cultural difference between Anglo-Saxon England and Pictish Scotland, that occurred because the Romans built a big damn wall across the land which although is not the exact Scottish border it has had a strong influence on modern politics and cultural identity language trade everything in this in the 2000 years ish 1900 years since it was built and bloody Romans basically there's a lot they've got to answer for and yeah so there was certainly an influence by the Romans over the Votadini and the other tribes that sort of brought them together and became what became what would eventually become the sort of Pictish culture. But it was, although an, uh, an estrangement from what they were before, effectively it was still the same people, and we shouldn't forget that. That's why the Scots are still considered a sort of Celtic culture. Anyway, this video's gone on long enough, and I've started to go off on a tangent, I've noticed, and I could do this for an hour before noticing I'm doing it. So I'm going to stop now and say... Like, share, subscribe, comment down below, hit the bell notification if you really want to, and of course, click on the link below if you want a glorious beard as good as, if not better than mine, if you already have one, check out the beard struggle, but if you are going to go, click on the link below, because if you do decide to buy something, click the link, sign up, you get a 15% discount for following that link. So. It's worth it. If you already buy stuff from someone else, just check them out. There might be something you like. I'm going to stop now because I'm going on again. If you made it over to the end of the video, thank you for watching and bye-bye.